start. Okay, so I think that we, we, we should start. Welcome everybody to our fifth meeting of the Seminar of Metaphysics of Science. It's uh, a pleasure for me to, to have a Christian Soto from the University of Chile, but right now he's in uh, the London School of Economics. Uh, okay, so his, his talk is gonna be about physical modality for physical laws. So Chris, you, you have roughly one hour uh, for, for the talk, but it's just up to you. And then we have questions and comments after that. So wherever you want. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to deliver this talk. Thank you, Christian. Thanks uh, to the group in uh, Lovan. Like I said earlier, I would have loved to be there to meet you in person and hopefully that'll happen anytime soon. I'm actually really scared to present this work, uh, both because uh, yesterday I was told that the LSE, that there was a very good group of uh, philosophers working on similar issues in uh, UC Levan. Uh, and also because this is not uh, published work, it's work in progress. I put a lot of thought into it, um, but I'm not sure yet if that's gonna be you know, the last result of the work. Uh, in any case, I'll do my best to try to be clear about which are the main claims and where actually I have some doubts yet into the progress of my uh, research. The title is Their Physical Modality for Physical Laws. Uh, the outline of the main tenet is actually quite simple. Uh, I try to elaborate and defend an account of physical modality for physical laws, where physical modality should be understood as if it were different from metaphysical modality or mathematical modality. So what I want to find out is whether physical modality could be enough for physical laws. Uh, I acknowledge the fact that most laws are routinely expressed in mathematical uh, terms, in terms of mathematical equations, uh, various sorts of equations indeed, uh, but they are ultimately intended to inform us about physical possibilities and physical uh, necessities. Uh, the second part of the talk will be mainly focused on the following issues. I will try to put forward arguments for, uh, you know, uh, try, trying to say that, trying to show that our account of physical modality for physical laws avoids and to collapse into human or anti-human views uh, on nomic modality. I will also try to do away with fears about the epistemic restrictions of physical modalities, and I'll face the uh, what, I, what I call the instrumentalist threat. Uh, I'll also try to make sense of mathematics contribution to nomic modality and abandon the distinction between accidents and necessities. In the last part, uh, I'll try to show how uh, we should deflate the source of modality metaphor that has been uh, predominating, pre predominating in the debate of laws of nature. So the first part, uh, I assume, will be you know, uh, broadly known for all of you, so I'll go through it rather quickly. There is a historical consideration about the source of modality metaphor. Uh, you surely know that the model interpretation of theories and models uh, suggest that uh, they are not only summaries of observed phenomena, actual phenomena. Instead, they try to inform us about possibilities and necessities of different sorts. Uh, this goes in accordance with a uh, tradition in metaphysics where possibility and necessity uh, are regarded model categories of being, modes of being. And well, the same goes uh, for laws of nature, of course. Uh, they are model in the sense that they inform us not only about um, uh, you know, summaries of events, uh, rather say to the information about ranches of possibilities and necessities in physical domain. Uh, there is a historical consideration here that I wanna I, I want to highlight. And the modern reading of laws is not something that we owe to the 20th or the 21st centuries. Uh, the issue occupied a central stage in the emergence and consolidation of laws in the 17th century. Uh, you may know uh, already that, uh, you know, most uh, natural philosophers in that epoch 
uh, did a lot of work trying to come up with a reason for the necessity of laws of nature. You can find details about that in Descartes' work or in Newton's Principia. And basically what they argue was that laws of nature were both imposed uh, by uh, God, the God of the Geo-Christianism, and their necessity was grounded upon uh, God's immutability. So they, they, they faced the issue of the source of modality for physical laws and provided a, an answer uh, for it. Um, the, the, the theological presupposition uh, played two roles. The first was to uh, account for the origins of laws, but also uh, the second uh, was to secure uh, laws' necessity and you know, to make sense of the apparent or orderliness of uh, phenomena. Now, uh, you may also be familiar with Aristotelian ontology, predominant before Descartes' uh, era. Uh, according to Aristotelian ontology, the causal conduct of substances uh, could be explained in terms of their uh, properties or formal causes, along with, of course, other causal determinations and the causal interactions between different substances. Uh, but causal conduct could be explained in terms of those uh, intrinsic properties. Now, uh, substances not only had their uh, natural place, but they also had a natural way to behave uh, causally interacting with other substances. Uh, so modality in this case was grounded by the nature of substances, their properties, and so forth. Uh, something interesting, something that's actually a uh, really interesting uh, happened by you know the late uh, medieval times when uh, people introduced the god of Judeo Christianism into the ontological scene because then when you what what you had there was something like a overdetermination uh, of causal influence so because on the one hand uh, you had Aristotelian causal properties whereas on the other you had this voluntaristic theological presupposition about God being causally influent on uh, the temporal evolution of being. So you had two causal, two, two different uh, sources of causation for the conduct of, uh, of, 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 of substances uh, in this uh, period. Now, uh, the, the, the question, of course, uh, was responded in different ways uh, before the emergence of laws of nature. Uh, it wasn't clear here whether you know, God only needed to impart the first movement on substances or whether he needed to keep things moving all the time or whether he needed to participate in specific occasions. So it wasn't clear at all. But something that was uh, clear in these debates in Suarez or Aquinas was uh, this potential causal overdetermination uh, into evolution of uh, things. That was uh, clear at least. But a way in which uh, natural philosophers uh, did away with the problem was abandoning Aristotelian ontology and introducing laws of nature. And that's the point that's gonna matter uh, to us in the rest of the talk. So what they did was uh, to say, okay, we won't explain the apparent orderliness of phenomena in terms of causal, uh, Aristotelian causal powers, and we will explain them in terms of laws of nature, got imposed laws on the mechanical, uh, a modal world, and uh, God in this way governs uh, the temporal evolution of uh, things. Uh, now, uh, in this case, there were two steps. The first was uh, that you could explain uh, the apparent orderliness of physical phenomena by introducing laws of nature, but the second was that natural philosophers were really concerned about the source of modality for physical laws, for the laws of nature. Uh, you can find a lot of details in the arguments provided by Descartes, Malbrand, uh, Newton, Berkeley, Boyle, and so forth. Uh, but basically, they ultimately uh, seemed to agree on the fact that the necessity of laws uh, was grounded by uh, you know, the immutability of God. Uh, what I want to, uh, what what I want to be really clear about uh, in this point uh, here is that there is a two-layer explanation because you have a common leitmotif, so to speak, the apparent orderliness of the world, uh, tend to do away with Aristotelian causal powers, 
you add the laws of nature, but then it seems that you need a second order explanation for the necessity of laws. And that is uh, drawn from uh, the immutability of uh, God. So uh, you can uh, look at this, uh, you can consider this point. Laws couldn't change as well as uh, we couldn't expect God's nature to change. And given God's omnipotence, a loss governed the mechanical world with strict necessity and found no exceptions uh, at all. Uh, th this point, uh, I like to claim, it's not only interesting from a historical perspective. The interesting fact about it is that uh, some of these assumptions about laws have remained throughout discussion on laws of nature until uh, today, uh, you know, until today, there are certain conceptual truths that we associate with laws of nature, conceptual uh, truths which usually go unchallenged in T debates. Um, one, one of them, of course, is, uh, you know, this source of uh, modality metaphor. Uh, there is a shared sense of the orderliness of the world which calls for an explanation um, an X explanation, and then there is a strategy for providing X. Aristotelians would say causal powers, early modern natural philosophers would say laws of nature. So laws provide an initial, an initial explanation, but then uh, we will need to provide uh, a, a second order explanation about why laws successfully explain uh, the orderliness, uh, the apparent or the orderliness, at least, of uh, phenomena. Now, from this, what we get in the second half of the 20th century is a standard way to, uh, you know, to, to conceptualize and debate the laws of nature. I'm only going to go quickly over this because um, I, I assume that you are all familiar with it. So the standard framework says that there are mainly two views, humanism and anti-humanism about nomic modality. In the humean branch, you find regularity, the regularity view of laws, and the best system account, and in the anti-humanian branch, you find theories of universals and theories of dispositions. Of course, here to this uh, classification, we will need to add counterfactual accounts of laws, measurements accounts of laws, primitivist accounts of laws, and so forth. I'm not doing this here. I'll mention additional uh, uh, accounts of laws later on in this talk, but this is you know, just the standard framework. The regularity view of laws would say that laws are summaries of uh, regularities, and there will be at least two stances available for those endorsing the regularity view of laws. Either we are elimin eliminativists about laws or we are agnostic about them, about the source of modality for laws. Either we deny that there is something to be said about an ontological groundwork for laws, or we remain agnostic about whether or not there is something to be uh, you know, said about the ground, ontological groundwork for nomic, uh, uh, for, for, for law statements. Uh, and in the best system account, laws occupy the place of axioms in our theoretical systems, delivering the best feed uh, between syntactic simplicity and informational uh, strength. And then again, what it's said here goes with the human spirit, at least in the sense that modality becomes a property of certain theories and that occupy the places, the place of axioms in a system in a, in a system in the systematization of our theories. They deliver the best fit, and we call them, you know, laws of nature. Uh, then in the anti-human uh, side, uh, theories of universal will say that laws are second order relational universals, governing first order universals that are instantiated in particular, you know, states of affairs. Uh, and the uh, kind of modality that we find here is uh, top-down, uh, second-order universals, imposed modality on first-order universals, and so forth. And then the second option for anti-humians is uh, the theory of dispositions, mainly in the form of dispositional essentialism, which will contend that laws emerge uh, from inherent, inherently modal essential dispositions that bestow modality on the particulars that uh, bear them, that poses them. And the, uh, the, the nomic structure here is, of course, uh, bottom up. You start with a theory of essential dispositions, and from there you get to uh, the laws uh, of nature. <clears throat> 
Now, uh, if you if you allow me to continue, uh, what I claim is that we need to go beyond the standard uh, framework. To debate between humans and anti-humans, anomic modality is metaphysical. Uh, I submit it is metaphysical both for humans and anti-humans. Uh, insofar as both views advance an interpretation about the ultimate constitution of reality uh, in order to account for nomic modality. This is the case, uh, for example, in the eliminative version of the regularity view of uh, laws. And the eliminative version of the regularity view of laws would say that there is nothing to be said about an ontological groundwork for our law statements. Then the best system account will require us to commit ourselves with Antichumian mosaic. The theories of universal, of course, will put forward universals. And so we'll do you know, the theories of disposition with an ontology of uh, essential dispositions. Uh, and the standard framework, I'll also claim in what follows, imposes unnecessary, actually undesirable constraints on the ways in which the problem regarding nomic modality can be understood. And, and actually, it, it, that, that's something that happened uh, to people trying to go beyond the standard framework. You will usually be told that any account of law in the end is doomed to collapse into either humans or anti-humans views of laws. Uh, and there will be no escape in this uh, regard. So that's something that I want to reject. <clears throat> so basically, what the standard framework, framework does is uh, to push us uh, to adopt stance on the source of modality uh, metaphor, either in an eliminativist fashion or in an anti-Humean uh, fashion. So here is a rest restatement of the problem that, that interests me at present. Our account pays attention to the fact that physical laws, most of which are routinely expressed in terms of mathematical equations, are in principle intended to inform us about ranches of possibilities and necessities, degrees of possibilities and necessities in physical uh, domains. A question uh, will emerge concerning the scope of mathematics contribution to these ranges of possibilities and necessities that we obtain uh, from laws. Uh, and here there, here there is something uh, really interesting. Mathematically expressed physical laws purport to deliver information about physical domains, but they do so at the cost of introducing mathematical abstractions and idealizations. And then one you know, can naturally uh, wonder whether the possibilities and necessities we inf infer from laws, from physical laws, <clears throat> are possibilities and necessities at least partially driving from the mathematical formalism employed in each case in the formulation of each law, particularly when surplus mathematical structure occurs in accepted physical laws. So that's uh, my uh, way of setting, uh, setting out the stage for uh, my analysis. So what I want to argue is that physical modality is crucial for our understanding of the modal character of physical laws. And that although mathematics is certainly relevant for inferential practices, such inferences need a physical interpretation. And in order for us to know about the physical possibilities and physical necessities about which laws inform us, uh, we need to provide an interpretation of the mathematical formalisms. Here is a first actually humble uh, approach to physical modality. Uh, I call this uh, following uh, Catherine Breiting, the epistemic road. Uh, one way to approach nomic modality consists in reflecting uh, on the scope of theories and model. Uh, theories and models usually refer not to particular things, but rather to theoretical kinds of objects. And here, Catherine Breiting, of course, with uh, her structuralist commitments, uh, she says that such theoretical kinds of objects correspond to the shared structure of uh, models, uh, are presented by the shared structure of uh, models. Uh, this is the case when it comes to physical laws. Uh, they are not intended to describe particular uh, physical systems. That's something that, that has been broadly acknowledged in the literature. 
loss instead codify model information about scenarios, usually ideal scenarios, uh, in which certain relations are, uh, you know, are, are will take place uh, among several uh, variables, constants, and other uh, constraints. Uh, as is routinely claimed in the literature, the Newtonian law of gravitation in classical mechanics uh, can be applied to various two-body systems, instantiating the classical gravitational relation. Uh, it doesn't describe any system in particular. Um, it actually, it couldn't be literally true of a system and so forth. It just provides modal information codified in the form of an equation that's susceptible of physical interpretation. And then <clears throat> the theories and models we accept provide us with a guide to our modal commitment. Uh, since believing a theory broadly amounts to, this is Catherine Braiding again, uh, placing a restriction on our beliefs about, about what will and will not happen based on what theoretically uh, can, cannot or and must happen. Uh, model commitment then can be distilled from our theories and models, which orient epistemic uh, practices. Uh, this is the epistemic road to physical modality. Why I call this the epistemic road? Well, because model discourse is imbricated in our acceptance of theories and models, and it can be kept in, in place without uh, breathing again, without making any commitment to modality at the ontological level. Uh, in the italics part is uh, where I want to take a little distance from breathing approach. Uh, I don't think that it would be enough uh, uh, to say that we don't need to make any commitment to modality at the ontological level. I want commitment to, uh, to, mo to modality at the ontological level. Uh, so the epistemic growth wishes to avoid the conundrums that the human and anti-human debate leaves an answer. Uh, remaining neutral regarding their metaphysical constructions on reality, that's okay. Uh, and then this works well, but only to a certain extent, since it ensues, en ensues the risk to take distance from uh, the physical dimension of uh, nomic modality. We may want to avoid embarking in metaphysical endeavors, uh, but this is compatible with acknowledge acknowledging that the modal commitment of theories and models expand beyond theoretical uh, considerations. Basically, what we want to show is that physical possibilities and physical necessities are entrenched in the physical uh, world. Uh, so that'll be the first approach, the epistemic road. Now let's move on to the second approach to physical modality, uh, inferential practices. And here I throw from a rather recent chapter by Jinan Ismail. Uh, our argument for physical modality embraces the fla a deflationary empiricist metho methodological assumption. We need not presuppose ontological commitment beyond what we find in our theories and uh, models. Uh, Ismail says scientific models are embodiments of our very best inductive practices. The model content of our models are to be understood in terms of their role <clears throat> guiding prediction and decision. Then again, what you have here is a body of theories and model that incorporate certain model beliefs and those model beliefs guide uh, your epistemic lives, so to speak, guide your inferential practices, your predictions, decision-making processes, and so forth. <clears throat> Physical laws do exactly the same and they guide our expectations in epistemic practices, informing us about what can or must be the case under this or that set of cir circumstances. According to Ismail, <clears throat> everything that there is to know about laws, chances, and other scientific modalities is given into account of how beliefs about chances are formed through inferential implications and the role they play in our uh, practical and epistemic lives. So here again is where I want to take a little distance, although in spirit, my proposal will, will be quite close to what Ismail suggests. Since I don't think that all there is uh, to laws and, ch and chances is this and guiding of our, is providing guidance to our epistemic uh, lives. So although the epistemic road to model commitment through theories and model is a stretch 
we must walk, uh, I highlight the emphasis there, is a stretch, we must walk. It's not the whole story that we can tell about model commitment. Inferential practices need not be in the seclusion of our minds. Uh, in scientific settings, actually, what matters is that we get our inferential practices correct because they inform us about what's physically possible or necessary in certain, under certain circumstances. An account of physical modality that is neither humean nor anti-humean may turn out to be uncomfortable for those uh, trained in the standard framework. And Ismail uh, uh, acknowledges this. Uh, she says that, uh, she suggests actually that uh, in her view, modality may seem to, pro to provide only shadows of law, uh, shadows of uh, modality, because it's neither humean nor anti-humean. And here, my precision could be that it need not be shadows of modality, insofar as we acknowledge that modality it's not an all or nothing matter, uh, that possibilities and necessities come in degrees, both come in degrees, uh, uh, hen hence accommodating uh, the various scopes of uh, physical laws. And, and here I get to the third uh, approach to physical modality, evidential uh, support, and here I draw from uh, what I believe is still an unpublished draft by John Norton, uh, what I claim at this point is that uh, there is no denying that theories and models best systematize and express our modal beliefs. Uh, then, however, uh, what matters is to understand the physical scope of our modal beliefs. Branches of possibilities and necessities are dictated by the relevant physical domains and not by our belief systems. Evidential support, key term here, evidential support, may prove our theories and models wrong or inaccurate, and only the increase of evidential support can teach us whether or not that's the case. So we are turning our eyes now onto the evidential support part of uh, physical uh, modality. We expect from our theories and models that if they are the best grasp of physical domains, of certain physical domains, then they are likely to be our best shot at the ranges of physical possibilities and necessities. Uh, here's a definition by Norton. He reconceptualizes possibility and necessity in the following terms. Uh, what's possible, according to the empiricist conception, is what our evidence positively allow, allows, uh, positively allows the evidence. And then what's necessary is what this evidence compels, yeah, allows or compels. Uh, and in view of laws, uh, we can say it and the following. Empirical evidence can speak in favor of degrees of physical possibilities for certain outcomes to take place. Empirical evidence and theoretical efforts shape our beliefs about physical possibilities, hence supporting inductions and generalizations, some of them leading to what we call laws. And empirical evidence may compel physical necessity. We judge physical necessity according to an arbitrary threshold, fulfilling accepted evidential standards in epistemic practices, leading us uh, to believe that certain facts couldn't have been or cannot be otherwise. And then a consequence following from this uh, is as follows. And physical possibilities, possibilities and necessities even when they are embodied in laws of nature, are fallible and corrigible. Uh, additional empirical evidence and theoretical efforts may force us to correct uh, intactive practices. And another consequence, the modal force of physical laws accepts of degrees. Some laws appear to apply throughout space-time, as in the case of Feinstein's conservation of mass and energy, uh, but in other cases, uh, laws would apply only locally, as in the case of Fresnel's equation about the reflection and transmission of light as a transverse uh, wave. Uh, so you, you, you see, so you start deriving a series of consequences about the character of laws by introducing these three arguments. First, the epistemic road to modality, uh, then uh, inferential practices, uh, and at a central stage, uh, three, the evidential support. 
Uh, so what I wanted to, in the rest of this uh, talk, is to try to put the proposal at work uh, by addressing, <clears throat> by addressing in this case, five issues, standard issues in the philosophy of laws uh, literature. And those issues are, well, the first, uh, this is really funny because I, I've been told this in a number of occasions, <clears throat> any account of loss will in the end collapse into either a human view of loss or an anti-human view of loss. So that's the first issue. Uh, I want to deal with it and show that that's not necessarily the case, that there is conceptual space for other possibilities for additional understandings of loss. <clears throat> and then the second issue will be that uh, our physical account for physical loss is inevitably epistemic uh, and that it may even fall prey of an instrumentalist threat, uh, which I don't think is, is the case. I'll argue so in what follows. Uh, and then a third issue is uh, that given the relevance of mathematics for the articulation of physical laws, well, mathematics ends up taking over nomic modality. Uh, I'll show why this uh, need not be the case. Uh, number four, I'll dispense, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, dispense with the distinction between accidents and necessities, which I believe is one of those supposed conceptual truths of laws of nature. Laws provide a distinction between uh, accidents and necessities, uh, and I don't see why this needs to be the case. And five, going back to the beginning of this talk, uh, I'll, I'll show how we can take the source of modality metaphor for what it is, uh, just an anachronism that we inherit from 17th century natural uh, philosophers, philosophy. So that's what I'll do now in the last part of the talk. Here's the first point. Uh, some <clears throat> will say that views on nomic modality cannot but be either human or anti-human. Uh, I've been told that in many occasions, uh, in many settings, and I know of people that <laughs> have been told that in various occasions as well. Uh, you wanna get out of the, of the standard framework? Well, you're wrong because you, at the end, you will need to either embrace a full-blown uh, commitment to modality or, or, or not. You'll go, you know, anti-human or human. Uh, but, well, the deflationary character of physical modality makes loss hacking to the human regularity of loss or to the best system account of loss. Now, that's, that, that's something that I'm uh, prepared to accept uh, since it shares with them the reaction of heavy metaphysical presuppositions. Uh, think of the best uh, system account and the epistemic road. The best system account, uh, what it does is to say that uh, certain theories achieve uh, uh, you know, the, the character of laws, the status of laws, once they go above a certain threshold. Uh, that's given by the best feat of uh, syntactic simplicity and informational strength. And what I'm saying now here in the first argument was that uh, theories and models provide access to uh, physical modality. So they actually sound quite similar. Uh, and then another reason for this would be that uh, on the anti-human side, some people will say, well, if physical modality is something at all, it must lean towards one of the following two options. Either laws exist, you know, as something different from the patterns that instantiate them, or, or there is something that grounds uh, the modal character of laws, uh, modal infused properties, universals, dispositions, and so forth. So if I want to say that physical laws is something, physical modality, uh, excuse me, physical modality is something, then there are only two options, we'll say uh, uh, an, an anti-human. Either laws are something or there is something grounding uh, the model status of uh, laws. Uh, but then I see a familiar case uh, in James Woodward's invariance based uh, account of laws. Uh, he runs into similar considerations regarding stand standard ways of framing T uh, debate with human views, the invariance-based account approach uh, 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 rejects uh, the need to posit non-human stuff in terms of universals, dispositions, and else. 
Uh, but against human views, the invariance base account defends that loss cannot be reduced to non-modal stuff. So what, what, what you see here is an attempt and by good work to provide an account of physical modality for loss that's non-human, uh, at least in the sense that uh, we don't uh, that, that we don't try to reduce loss to something that's not modal, uh, but that it's human insofar as you try to avoid adding layers of ontology that are grounded only in metaphysical speculation. Uh, finding a middle way doesn't come easy, uh, but this is only due to the metaphysical expectations ensued by uh, the standard framework, by the source of modality metaphor, predominating in the debate. So our analysis of physical modality for loss is neutral with respect to both uh, to further metaphysical commitments, be there, be them, you know, human or anti-human, uh, and physical modality is captured by the modal beliefs emb embodied in our models and theories. But physical modality isn't restricted to belief systems, since it's, uh, it rests on evidential support shaping interactive generalizations. Uh, now, here is a second uh, comment. Uh, we can easily move in our physica, in our account of physical modality, uh, we can easily move from epistemic fears to the instrumentalist threat. Uh, it may be argued that the flashinary character of physical modality is epistemic rather than ontological in character. And if that's the case, then it's widely disappointing since we want our account of physical modality to account for the character of physical loss. Uh, and things will get worse once the epistemic threat becomes, uh, becomes radically instrumentalistic. The epistemic interpretation of physical modality makes it clear that modality, the modality at stake is largely linguistic, having to do with models and theories uh, and not uh, with the world, um, uh, or, or at least not largely linguistic, but just uh, uh, exclusively theoretical. The instrumentalist threat continues uh, in a well-known uh, manner. Uh, we need not care about whether such beliefs are physically informative, but only about whether they enable us to save future experience. Theories and models embody model belief need not be true to be good. They can be useful um, without being true. Uh, and we can accommodate them as we wish to save anomalous uh, uh, phenomena and so forth. So if, ah, there we go. So in response uh, to the conflation of epistemic uh, possibility and physical possibility, one can follow Norton. Uh, I'm following Norton again here, page 21 of his uh, manuscript. Uh, epistemic possibility, uh, I'm changing, of course, the terms and focusing exclusively on nomic modality. Epistemic possibility comes really close to physical possibility, informing us about, wh about uh, uh, what we can know uh, to be possibly the case. Epistemic possibilities relies on agents, uh, but physical possibility relies on the way physical domains are and is ultimately grounded in evidential support. Uh, that is, uh, we firstly approach physical modality by examining our theories and models, and secondly, we judge them to be reliable guides for our inferential practices and epistemic lives overall, so long as they are supported by empirical evidence grounding inductive practices that leads us to generalizations of various sorts regarding physical possibilities and necessities. And then again, uh, think of cases in which theories and models are corrected or even abandoned and replaced by new ones. Such changes are mainly motivated by the increase of evidential support. And to diffuse the instrumentalist threat, we can still investigate how we actually provide physical interpretation for theories and models expressing physical laws. And I move on now to this point in number three. But does mathematics take over nomic modality? Here there is a number of considerations and the apparent indispensability of mathematics for physical laws makes an initial case for the contribution of mathematics to the modal scope of laws. Uh, not only are laws expressed in mathematical terms, but in some cases, uh, parcels of, sur of surplus mathematical structures occur in laws 
Uh, and even though they resist physical interpretation, they may be essential in contributing to uh, the solution, possible solutions to certain equations or facilitating uh, inferential uh, practices. So this, it's claimed, suffices for arguing that Laws's modality is partly mathematical. Of course, I wanna deal with that and show that physical modality is uh, crucial uh, and not so mathematical modality. It should be acknowledged that the application of mathematics to the formulation of physical laws is largely effective. Uh, remember Bickner, 1960. Now, the effectiveness of mathematics in the formulation of laws shouldn't be read as if laws were purely mathematical statements or as if the mathematical character of laws were to prove and to ultimate mathematical constitution of reality. Uh, what we need instead is to account for the ways in which mathematics contributes to the formulation of laws. Uh, and some people, particularly Mauro Dorato and uh, Arisu Islami have done some uh, brilliant work in this uh, regard. Uh, the challenge uh, has to do with our ability to provide uh, suitable physical interpretations for mathematically expressed physical laws. There is a continuum. In some cases, providing such an interpretation uh, for mathematically expressed physical laws comes easy. Think of Kepler's laws or Hooke's laws for springs. Uh, but in other cases, providing physical interpretation to, for a mathematically formulated law will prove harder, if, especially if uh, surplus mathematical structure occurs in such a law. Uh, that is the case, I believe, uh, with the general form of the time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation. Uh, in, this equ in this equation, I uh, is an imaginary number. Uh, you have H bar, that's the reduced Planck constant, and C is the state vector of a quantum system. Imaginary numbers, uh, the reduced Planck constant, and the, the state vector of a quantum system all of them present various difficulties uh, when it comes to offer uh, mapping from the target physical domain to the mathematical structure. Uh, imaginary numbers, uh, I assume, uh, do not find a counterpart, con counterpart in the world, making a case for the claim that the equation bears more mathematical structure than the physical structure we can attribute to a target system. Uh, but beyond the interpretive difficulties, the general form of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation provides information about the wave function of a quantum system evolving through time. So it provides certain interpretation, certain information. It's susceptible uh, to certain interpretations. Applications of this equation requires us to specify the Hamiltonian for the quantum system, considering the kinetic and potential energy of the particle constituting the system in question. The equation delivers uh, thus, a space of physical possibilities for a quantum system, which can be adjusted to various scenarios by considering the relevant Hamiltonians in each uh, case. Uh, so what we have there is, uh, once again, you know, physical laws that are expressed mathematically, and some may say, well, given the relevance of mathematics and the effectiveness of mathematics in the articulation of laws, so it may be the case that it's not physical modality that's turned to war, it's actually mathematical modality. Uh, but what I contrary here to that is that what you need is to provide a physical interpretation to the mathematical uh, formalism. Uh, but not, of course, to all the mathematical formalism, uh, specifically in those, case, in those cases where surplus mathematical structure uh, appears. So what about the distinction between accidents and necessities? Uh, here, uh, what we find is a distinction that has been assumed as a dogma or a conceptual truth of laws of nature. Uh, there, are, there are a number of such conceptual truths. One of them was uh, recently addressed by uh, Sartner, Gillian Humphreys, Gillian Humphreys, uh, and that has to do with uh, the fact that laws don't change. Well, just like, like that dogma, there is another dogma that any theory of law should provide a distinction categorical distinction between laws and accidents. But then the distinction is never, nevertheless misplaced. It need not be a conceptual truth of laws of nature that they provide a categorical, a categorical distinction uh, in those terms. And it's not an empirical truth of science that, it, that its laws provides us with such a distinction. So on the one hand, on the conceptual side, 
uh, laws of nature need not be uh, something that provides a distinction between two parts of the world, two sets of facts, accidents and necessities. But on the other hand, on the other hand, in the scientific side, uh, it's not an empirical truth of science that its laws provide such a distinction uh, either. Now, recent literature, fortunately, uh, has come to call into question the purported, this purported desiratum theories of nomic stability uh, by Sandra Mitchell or nomic invariance by Goodworth have consistently argued that nomic modality comes into Greece. And I move along the same lines. The model status of physical laws, common degrees, uh, laws are intended to inform us about branches of possibilities and necessities. Some laws are strictly phenomenological, as the aforementioned Fresnel's equations, other apply uh, to very specific systems and can be construed as local empirical generalizations, as the hooks, hook law for springs, and yet all the purport to deliver model information obtaining uh, throughout space-time. Um, and here's the, mod the, here's the moral. Uh, physical laws do not amount to any special category in ontology. Laws are just like any other facts, uh, only that the scope of their physical possibilities and necessities uh, is uh, widely informative and relevant uh, to us. And here's the last point. And with this, I'm closing my uh, talk today. Uh, how should we interpret the source of modality uh, metaphor? Well, <clears throat> I think it's just an anachronism that we inherit from natural philosophy. You may remember here uh, from Frassen 1989 saying that the expression law, law of nature is an anachronism. Well, I'm not that sure about that, but I'm sure that the uh, argumentative strategy of the source of modality metaphor is an anachronism. Uh, the expression source of modality uh, is, a, is a metaphor. Remember, if there are laws of nature, and if we assume that they are modal in character, uh, a source is to be found for their modality, uh, then there I, I will ask, uh, but, but, but why? Uh, how come? Why? The regress uh, moves a step farther back. Laws, which were introduced to explain the apparent orderliness of the physical world, uh, are now wanting an explanation of their model scope. And that's what you know, natural philosophers in the 17th century uh, think. Humans and anti-humans, this is my take, uh, have overreacted to the requirements imposed by the source of modality metaphor. The farmer, of course, by doing away with modalities uh, in the world altogether, and the latter by positing extra layers of ontology. So they have, fa they have felt compelled to do so because of this argumentative strategy imposed by the source of modality metaphor. Well, we shouldn't follow the source of modality metaphor. Our account of physical modality uh, identifies a middle point. Uh, first, we dispense uh, with the source of modality metaphor. And second, we hold a commitment to laws informing us about just possibilities and necessities in physical domains. And by deflating the source of modality metaphor, we free our accounts uh, from standard ways to articulate the problem. The goal of the debate uh, is not one related to grounding nomic modality in something else or adopting a stance on whether or not we have such a grounding for nomic modality. The goal of the debate is just to account for uh, the physical scope of uh, laws. Well, uh, here's the uh, outline you know, of uh, some concluding remarks. Like I said at the beginning, this is a work in progress. I haven't published this work. I'm aware of many points in which I, I need to do further work, but um, uh, it's a fact of history that nomic modality has posed a challenge since uh, 17th century natural philosopher, philosophy. Humans and anti-humans <clears throat> have dominated the debate, but uh, I provided a drawing actually uh, perhaps a bit heavily from uh, works by Catherine Brading, Jinan Ismail and John Norton uh, I provided three arguments, what I've called the epistemic road to physical modality, uh, uh, inferential practices, 
and um, evidential support for inductive generalizations in order to just offer an outline of uh, what physical modality could mean for physical laws. And my goal is uh, to show, has been to show that uh, this kind of physical modality for physical laws has the benefits of, uh, well, uh, giving a step further, you know, uh, beyond the standard framework for the debate. Uh, it doesn't go down the slippery slope of instrumentalism. Uh, it takes into account the fact that physical laws are expressed in mathematical terms without compromising the key role of physical modality for laws. Uh, it dispenses, or it doesn't need, the distinction between accidents and necessities. And uh, it does away with this anachronistic, anachronic uh, metaphor of the source uh, of modality. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Christian, for the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. So we are going to take probably five minutes off, and then we, we come back to start the discussion. So see you in five minutes. <laughs>